Welcome, welcome, welcome to Discovery Church, man. We're so excited you guys are here. Are you guys excited to be here today? Good. Then we're both on the same page. This is amazing. Hey, do me a favor. We want to welcome those who are joining us online. Thank you so much for checking in and joining us there. Uh, and also our Northwest campus. Let's celebrate those who are joining us from all over. Uh, amen. We know that uh, we got some folks from Uganda jumping in. We've been able to build an amazing uh, connection out there. And so we know God's going to do amazing things in Uganda as well. Well, hey, I'm excited to be here and share a message today with you. We are just finishing up our Dream to Destiny series. How many of you guys love that Dream to Destiny series? Amen? Amen. Hey, I know it's like eight months of amazing. I know it's a great and powerful word. Hey, uh, and Dr. Jeffrey did such an amazing job last week of closing that out and bringing clarity. Um, if you miss any of those, you could always check those out uh, on our YouTube platform. We have them all on demand. We have like all of our services on demand. So if you're new to Discovery and you're a big fan, jump on there. You got a lot to download. Um, but today we're making a shift and we're, uh, we got a message today that's a little different, moving off of our dream to destiny and, and moving forward. And um, today what we're going to focus on is something that um, I heard this week, and, and couple, actually it was a couple weeks back, but I've been wrestling with it for a while now. And it was some statistics that, uh, honestly, it just broke my heart when I heard them. And i um, been wrestling with this idea for a while now, and, and I, I want to share those statistics with you. And um, I want to just preface it first and, and, and set your heart um, a little bit, set it up for it. Because um, as we're going to walk through today's message, you're going to have like one of two reactions to it. Okay, The first one is you're going to get frustrated, annoyed, and angry, and push it away and say, it's not for me, that's not about me, that's not who I am. Or, and then the other one is to say, maybe there is something going on inside of me. Maybe there is something there that I, I'm not aware of and I need to, to become aware of and make some changes, okay? And I'll, I'll set it up. I mean, one of those is, is prideful and one of those is humility. And I just ask that we approach this message today with some humility and just say, is there something going on within me that could be leading things a certain way. And so what I mean by that is, so let's take a look at these statistics, okay? And so the first one is that of a general audience polled, right, not Christian audience, of just folks out there in America, they were asked, what, how do you perceive Jesus, positive or negative? Just Jesus and his message. And 71% say they view Jesus in a positive light. That's great news, honestly. I mean, in America, like, th like less than 40% of people are practicing the, the faith of Christianity, right? Less than 40%. So 70%, that means that there's potential for us to introduce them to Jesus. But, but here's where things kind of get a little bit uh, off course. Um, of those asked how they view Jesus, they were then asked how you view followers of Jesus, Christians, and that number changes. And now 49% of those addressed and said, 49% of them I see as hypocrites, and 48% I see as judgmental. And I, I heard that, and it, it, it made me pause. It made me stop and think and, and really start to wrestle with some things internally because what happens is it leads to this final statistic. And what that is, is that those asked that are without faith, meaning that they address and they say that I am not a follower of Jesus. I'm not a follower of anything. I don't believe that there's anything at all out there for me. What they said is the number one reason that those without faith questioned their faith, if they once had it or question it now, is because of hypocrisy of religious people. What that means is that when people look at Jesus, they're not against him. What it means is when they look at Jesus, they then look at his followers and say, no, that's not something I want to follow. It leads to this quote that I think spreads it so well. It's by Brendan Manning, and he says, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. That's what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. Now, I, I walked into this, and and if I'm being honest, it, it broke my heart. I mean, I love Jesus. I love Jesus with all my heart and all that I am. And I, and I looked at this and I thought to myself, Jesus, God, is there, is there something I'm doing? Is there something within my heart, within my walk, that people want to find you and they look at me and they say no? 
Am I misrepresenting you and creating a barrier or a wall for somebody to come and find you? Am I a barrier? Am I a roadblock? I don't want to be somebody that someone looks at and says, I'm a big fan of who you follow, but there's no way I'm going to join up with you. And I have to stop, and, and I want us all to just stop and, and think about this and say, is there something within me? Is there something that I'm doing that when somebody is saying, I want to find out more about Jesus, they walk up to meet you and they say, never mind. Now, I don't want this to be like a punch you in the face kind of message because it's not. Because here's the truth of it. If that's a circumstance we're in, it's unintentional, and I know it. We know it. Right? Like it's this idea of, I don't think anybody's out there and they're saying, dude, I'm going to misrepresent Jesus so bad that my neighbor will never find him because I hate that guy. I'm playing for the end game here, right? If they don't, if they don't like Jesus, they're never going to find him and that's a score for me, right? Nobody's doing that. But what happens is that we kind of fall into the, what we think is normal or natural and that normal or natural lifestyle is actually hindering what it is that Jesus is trying to do on this earth. And in, in our lives, what it can look like is sometimes we've come to know this faith or we're walking it out. And what happens is somebody led us there. Somebody helped us find Jesus. And we started emulating qualities that we thought were qualities that Jesus loved and celebrated. And we're like, Jesus, but in fact, they're not. And in fact, it's pushing others away from the faith that we have come to find. So... Uh, I want to stop and talk to, if you're online or if you're at Northwest or you're here in person with us, and you're coming to check it out, and maybe you are not a follower of Jesus. You don't categorize yourself as that. Maybe you categorize, categorize yourself as the non. I don't have a faith. I was brought here because my mama made me, right? Or I came here just because I wanted to check it out, right? I want you to understand. Today, I hope that you walk out of here with a different perspective. I want you to understand what it is that Jesus is about. And if anybody has polluted that context, I hope that we bring some clarity to it today. But more than anything, what I want to bring clarity to is this idea. And that is, I'm again, not trying to punch Christians upside the head. Here's the truth of it. We are a broken people. All of us. In a broken world. Trying to represent a perfect God. We're going to fall short. We're going to make mistakes. And we're going to... Let some people down, okay? But what I want to focus on today is are we living a life daily that's misrepresenting, creating barriers unnecessary for somebody to come in and seek after our Lord and Savior, and they pause when they see you and they say, never mind. If there are things that we're doing in our lives actively, then those are things that we need to check ourselves down, recognize, and turn away from it. Amen? So Jesus spells it out so perfectly. <clears throat> Jesus had a kind of faith that walked out that led people to him, right? And, and, and not just good people, some really bad people were led to Jesus. They heard about him and they said, I want to actually get to know this guy that you're talking about, right? And we see it actually beautifully in the story of Zacchaeus. If you're not familiar with this story, it's amazing. Make sure you get a moment and go check it out. But the story of Zacchaeus, so this dude is a tax collector. He's not just a regular tax collector. He's a chief tax collector. And no, it's not like a manager of the IRS. He's not like walking around in his business suit. Like, you know, it was different back then, man. So what this would mean, Zacchaeus was Jew by birth. So he was one of the people within the nation he lived. But he represented a nation away from them that has now occupied and seized their nation and their land and is instilling their rules, their guidelines, and their taxes. So they're taking from Jerusalem and giving to Rome. Okay, so Zacchaeus, there's two things we know about him. Chief tax collector, and the second thing is he's super rich. How does he get rich? Literally by collecting over the taxes what he wants to put in his pocket. Meaning, Zacchaeus was really good at bullying people to pay extra taxes so he could get rich. Which means that those looking at Zacchaeus would know the dude is loaded because he has my money. That's Zacchaeus, right? Doesn't sound great, right? Doesn't sound like an upstanding individual. But Zacchaeus hears about Jesus, and Jesus is walking down the road in Jericho. And so what he ends up doing, Zacchaeus, is he walks into this moment, and he says, I'm not going to push into the crowd. It says he was short. That's actually the third thing we know about Zacchaeus. He was vertically challenged. 
Nobody in here knows what that's like, right? So he's vertically challenged. So dude says, I can't get into the crowd. I can't push through the crowd. What I'm going to do is climb this tree. I'm going to climb this tree as high as I can just so I could get a look at Jesus because there's just something about him I want to know. So Jesus walking along sees this tiny man climbing this giant tree. Knowing his reputation, because we know Jesus knew him, Jesus calls out in front of everybody, and he says, Zacchaeus, I want to eat some dinner with you tonight, my man. And the whole crowd looks, and they say, Jesus, you don't want to eat with this dude because this dude's a terrible person. So they actually look at Jesus and say, who is this man that he's willing to eat with such scum? Right? The crowd is saying, no, 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 you want nothing. The crowd is trying to create a barrier between Jesus and Zacchaeus. But what ends up happening is by the end of the encounter that Jesus has with Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus right in the middle. It's not like Zacchaeus gave everything up and then he decided to meet Jesus. No, right in the middle of all of it, Jesus meets with Zacchaeus. And by the end of their moment, Jesus tells Zacchaeus, truly salvation has come to this house. So despite the barriers, Zacchaeus was able to find it. That's the kind of lifestyle that Jesus had that it drew people not once they were clean. Not once they were good. It drew them in in the middle of it. And by the end of the encounter, they were different. It prevented a barrier before so that they could come and encounter, and then they would experience life change after. Okay? That's what our faith is supposed to represent. So how do we get there? Like, like how do we get that kind of contagious faith? Jesus literally just tells us in very clear words how it is that we're supposed to be focusing our lives And what we're supposed to be doing. And it's in the Gospel of John. It's the Last Supper. John 13, 31 through 35. And when we're looking at that, just so you understand context, it's the Last Supper. It's the last time Jesus is going to be able to chill with his disciples. We've done the foot washing. He's served them. He's loved on them. And so now Jesus, Judas has left the room. So now it's, it's the legit disciples now are in the room. And Jesus starts giving them instructions. And he says, the time has come for the Son of Man to enter his glory. He says, dear children, I'm going to be with you only a little longer. And as I told the Jewish leaders, you're going to search for me, but you're not going to know where I'm going. You can't come there. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. He says, just as I have loved you, you should love each other. How did Jesus love them? Incredibly. If you think the disciples' journey, that the disciples, the moment Jesus called them into the fold, the moment Jesus said, hey, come and follow me, that suddenly they were perfect specimens of faith, just read it for a minute. They're writing their own gospels. Matthew writes his own gospels while giving accounts of all the ways that they continue to screw up. Jesus loved them despite them, right? Loved them so much so he goes to the cross for them, right? Right? And he says, your love for one another, what that's going to do is it's going to prove to the world that you're my disciples. What's going to draw people in and make you contagious is the way that you love one another. But we sometimes naturally prioritize other things. We naturally move into a different way that our faith should look that we think is what's going to be better for this Christian faith. But in reality, it's pushing away from this idea of love. So what we're going to be looking at as we walk through, we're first going to look at what were some of the things that Jesus really was not a big fan of. What did he draw attention to and say that this is absolutely wrong? And how do we sometimes end up in those kind of situations or that kind of posture? And then we're going to look at what is it that Jesus celebrated, right? What is it that Jesus, when he came into an encounter with it, he said, hold up everybody. Look at this. This is amazing. Because I don't know about you, but that's what I want to be about. Like, that's what I want my life to represent. Something that Jesus would be walking along the road and stop and say, ooh, that's what's up. That's what, that, that person gets it, right? Like, that's what I want my life to be because I know others are going to stop and look and say, there's something going on there. There's something different about that guy, right? That's that contagious faith lifestyle. So first we're going to look at what is sometimes that toxic faith that can find a way into our lifestyle. And the first toxic thing that sometimes we could walk into is that we prioritize rules over relationships. They get it. Prioritize rules over relationships, right? What does that look like? It's that concept of do you concern yourself more with the thoughts of what you're doing wrong than you do the concern of your neighbor's salvation? Right? What bothers you at night when you're trying to go to bed? All the things that you did wrong 
or all the people that you're trying to bring in and understand the faith and the gospel? Like, what breaks your heart more, your mistakes or the world being lost? We could sometimes get so caught up in this same routine of the self-purification, the self-betterment, the way that we're going to improve our own lives. And it's literally like this hamster wheel, right? Because you get on that hamster wheel and all you're doing is the same routine over and over every day because what you're trying to do is just better yourself over and over again and you're not doing anything or looking anywhere outward. It's all inward and self-betterment. Okay? That's where we will prioritize rules. We'll prioritize doing things right. We'll make sure that we're, God, I'm, I'm, I just don't want to make a mistake. I don't want to mess up. We're not looking outward. We're all just looking here. And I want to just be right. I want to I do everything I can to follow your rules and make sure I'm not coloring outside the lines. And I'm telling you, Jesus had a much more outward focus. And he pushed a much more outward focused faith than sometimes we realize. So a, a way that we see this, it, we talk about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They're brought up a lot in the Gospels. And usually they're not brought up in a very positive way, right? And for us, as we're learning about them, sometimes we're going to assume that, like, they're the enemies in the story and, and we don't relate to them at all. They're the villains, right? They're the bad guys. The truth is, and I know in my life, I can relate to the Pharisees easily a lot of times because the Pharisees, what they believe is the better I am and the more faith I have and the more I follow these rules, the closer I get to God. The truth of the situation is I'm only close to God because of the grace given to me. And if I believe that it's by my works that suddenly I'm getting a step closer to heaven, I'm making it about me. And when I get to heaven's gates, if I'm like, well, Jesus did some really good things, but did you see the things I did too? It's not going to go over too well, right? We have to get up there and we just say, it's, it's him. I'm here because of him. And they say, well, what would you do with it? I told everybody. It's him. So what does this look like in, in the gospel? Luke gives us a narrative of an account that Jesus really spoke into this moment and really called some people out for their area of, of over prioritizing rules over relationships. So Luke 6, it says, Jesus knew their thoughts, and what he's talking to here is that the Pharisees are literally setting up a trap. This is how crazy the situation is. They gather, and they set a trap. They're like, let's get somebody in need, hurting, and desperate. Let's trap Jesus to see if he'll sin by doing a work on the Sabbath. We'll get him. Because they're saying the best thing we could do is set him up to sin. And if he sets up to sin, then everything is lost. That's all right. We're going to see if he can. Uh, they don't care. This individual has a deformed hand. They're not caring about his need and what Jesus can do for it. They're prioritizing and setting him as a trap because they're prioritizing rules over this man's circumstance. So they get the deformed hand guy. That's probably a mean way to label him, but that's how he's labeled here, okay? He says, come and stand in front of everyone. So the man comes forward, and Jesus said to his critics, he says, I have a question for you. Does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath, or it is a day, or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save a life or destroy it? We all know this should be a super simple answer. We all know in our lives it's a super simple answer. If I asked you, what should you prioritize? Bringing somebody else a salvation message or getting a little bit better in how you're living your moral compass? All of us would look and say, of course we want somebody to find Jesus. Do you prioritize it that way? And so what ends up happening is Jesus asks this question, and no one's answering, and he literally looked around at them one by one. Like, dude, this is a simple question. Just help me out here. It's a simple question. Answer it. And they all just sit there and look at him. And they're like, we're going to get him here. And he tells the guy, he says, hold out your hand. And the man holds out his hand, and it was restored. It's a beautiful moment because this man was living his whole life crippled, in a situation, I'm telling you, 2,000 years ago, they didn't have ways to, to help the handicapped. This person was just stuck in his situation, probably begging, probably not allowed to the Holy of Holies because he himself is not full and holy. So he's lived his whole life less than. And Jesus has now restored it. And their response is not to celebrate the man. Their response is, how can we kill Jesus? In our lives... We can overlook 
the relationships of those around us, and instead we start killing things off so that we can look better and holier and prioritize the rules of what we're trying to follow rather than the relationships of those who need to find Jesus. Okay? There's another area, another trap that we can fall into, and that is sometimes we prioritize perception over transformation. And uh, just an honest confession from me, this is, this is my jam. <laughs> this is my hang-up. This is my situation. This is my hiccup. I get so caught up in what others think of me that sometimes it can trump the truth of what Jesus is speaking into my life. That's like, that's my situation. I'm just being open and vulnerable with you guys. Sometimes I care so much about the perception of others that it trumps the transformation that Jesus is trying to have in my life. It becomes in this way. It's not a, an intentional thought. It's literally just that in my mind, I'll think, what does such and such think if I do this? What would blah, blah, blah think if I do that? I'm not now listening and saying, God, what is it that you're leading me to do? I'm now thinking, what is it that I could filter through of all the thoughts of everybody else to make sure I'm staying safe and everybody's going to be okay with my decisions? I'm prioritizing the perception of how I'm going to look to make sure I'm staying looking holy and great and amazing rather than just what is it that, Jesus, you're doing a work in my life to do, and how do I represent that externally? It's an inward work that is expressed externally. But the trap becomes this, and I know you guys know it. Let's just be real with each other. What happens is, is we showed up to church and we're like, I need it. I'm broken. I'm lost. I need it so bad. And you walked in and you looked and you saw everybody else has got it together. And you're like, whoa. I mean, if everybody else has got it together, I probably should look like I got it together too. So then you stand up there and you're like, yeah, man, I'm good. How are you? I'm good, man. I'm great. And internally, you're broken. You're like, I just don't know what to do. And the difficult part, this is the funniest part, is then when you go to the other 99%, they're sitting there saying, I'm broken inside. I don't know what to do. But he looks like he's got it together, so I need to make sure I look like I got it together. And so we're all just perceiving one another and saying, well, I got to put on that mask too. Oh, I, I got to have that too. Rather than just looking and saying, man, I am in desperate need of a Savior. Perception can sometimes trump the true transformation of what we need internally. And so what does that look like? In Matthew 23, 25 through 28, Jesus was not a big fan of outward expression without inward truth. Okay, and this is what he called it, okay? He called it this. This ain't me. He says, what sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you're so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you're filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first wash the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside comes clean too. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, you hypocrites? You're like whitewashed tombs. You're beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. See, on the outside, you look like the righteous people, but inward, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. You're so concerned with how others are going to see you and celebrate you and think you're doing everything right. And your, your life is just so put together. But truth, on the inside, man, you are just broken and junk. And you just don't know how to get rid of the, the, the filter because in your mind, this is just what we do. Can I tell you, vulnerability is a beautiful thing in the faith of Christ. Honesty is a beautiful thing in your transformation journey. And so in, in this idea of, of the inside reflecting what's happening outside, we all are familiar with, some, with, with somebody who has taken on a persona that's not theirs. And, and we call it, uh, if you guys are, know the check when it's like phoniness, you ever had somebody come up to you that was like, dude, I just love this, so I love you so much. So, and, that, and you just sit there like, ah. Come on, we all know it. We've all had those people, right? That, that it, it feels like, like, as you're saying it, I feel like it's hurting you, right? And, that, and, and that's sometimes just somebody with an outward perception that they're trying to keep, that, oh, I'm so glad that you were able to get that no, new boat. Can you believe they got that new boat, right? Like, outwardly, yeah, this is the things I'm supposed to do, but inwardly, I am polluted and desperate. So what I ask us to do is just to stop and say, look, here's the thing. Inward, we are all broken inside. That is our status quo. 
Can we just accept our internal brokenness and then take the next step and extend it to the brokenness of your neighbor? Understand that we are all going through a transformation process. So as you are looking to receive grace, why don't you give a little to your neighbor? Because we are all going through an internal transformation process that's starting to filter out externally. We'd prefer that over a fake outward expression and a polluted inward faith. That's what outsiders are looking at. The constant is hypocrisy because what they're looking at is saying, they are representing something on the outside, but I could see past it, and it's cringy, and it hurts, and I don't want any part of that faith because it just looks phony. If we shifted it instead and just said, oh, my goodness, I am struggling, but God's going to lead me through it. Right? If we just showed a truth of transformation within, I think people, instead of pushing it away, will start to draw it near. The third thing that we need to prioritize in this walk is being right over being reconciled. And I forgot to preface it because to me this is like one of the hardest ones right here. This idea of, of us focusing on the priority of being right. Okay, I, I think we can all stop and examine ourselves and say, I have definitely in my life, given a lot of thought and process to making sure I'm right and the other person knows it, right? Like I look at this and I say, when you go home during the day, do you spend more time praying for the lost and finding a way to, to, to reach your neighbor and bring salvation or do you spend more time researching your opinions to make sure that they are correct? Do you spend more time studying your side of the argument than you do studying about your God that you follow? If so, you could have this difficult situation here that you are so focused on being right that you're missing out on relationships and reconciling them. Okay? So in, in, in our life, is, it, is our priority for them to know our point, our side, or our belief, or for them to meet Jesus? Right? If we misprioritize that, then we're pushing people away. If Jesus spent his whole life correcting the Romans, because the Romans were crazy, y'all. If you don't understand, like, if the gospel would just be full. If Jesus felt his need to be right all the time, the gospel would be full of him always going up to Romans and being like, you know there's not like 400 gods, right? It would just be full of, the Romans had such crazy beliefs in how to live and how to love and how to hold a family. They literally, there's so much wrong with the Romans' idea of what it was to live a life, right? And, and Jesus would spend all his time every day, if he focused on being right, because he's right. He's always right. He's Jesus. But the only time we see him making a point to give correction and bring rightness is against the Pharisees and the Sadducees who would create barriers for them to find him. That's when he'd step in and he'd say, quit filtering the faith. Quit putting unnecessary burdens on them that they don't need because they need to just come and find me. But we create all these unnecessary barriers of everything that everyone has to believe before they could come and find our faith. Jesus was not about that. He was about other things. And so when we look at 2 Timothy and this idea of, this is Paul writing to Timothy, right? And Paul's telling Timothy as leaders, these are things that we need to, to champion as leaders in the church, as followers of Jesus. And he says, again, I say, don't get involved with foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. Because a servant of the Lord must not quarrel. But he must be kind to everybody. Like 90% of us just got kicked out the door. Right? Paul, that must be misquoted. <laughs> They got to be able to be kind to everybody. They got to be able to teach, and they got to be patient with difficult people. What that means and the truth of our situation to create a contagious faith is this, and please understand it, that whoever is constantly on the other side of your arguments, whatever it is, if it's a political group, if it's a stance, if it's an idea, if whatever it is on the other side of the argument, your job is not to fight the argument. Your job is to be kind with difficult people and get them to meet Jesus. That's the priority in your faith. Prioritizing their relationship with the Father rather than your need to be right. And I know it's difficult because feeling right feels great. Right? It's great when you get it right. But here's the thing. It's not about how we feel. It's about them finding a moment to find Jesus. So as we're shifting this concept, right, I want us to stop. And I know that some of you guys may have just walked through those three things. And you're saying, I'm safe. I'm none of these. 
Can I just pause you for a second? Can I pause you online? Can I pause you at Northwest? Here's the thing. One of those hit home with you, whether you know it or not. And what I want you to do is just stop and choose one. Say, I'm going to look at my life this week, and I'm going to prioritize and see, is this something I struggle with consistently, okay? Focus on one. Find one thing, because I'm telling you, one of those things is permeating into your faith and potentially preventing people from walking in it. So now we're going to look at the other side. I want to look at what it was that Jesus celebrated, and I want to emulate that. Like, I want to be about the things that Jesus stopped and said, that is amazing. I love to see that. And, and I want him to say that about me, because I know that if I'm living a life that Jesus celebrated, it's going to draw people in. And what I get the opportunity to do then, when people are drawn in, I get the opportunity to say, you know how I got here? Because of him. There is no better feeling than that, than introducing people to your Savior. Amen? So the first thing that we're going to do for us to have those kind of moments is we got to prioritize honor over status. Honor over status. And so I talked a little bit already about this, uh, the way the Romans were living with the, the Jews. And we have yet to, I mean, we're unpacking history, right? And if we, we now, 2,000 years later, have a hard time understanding just how much tension there was then with the Romans and the Jews. But here's the thing we know for sure. Romans, no matter who they occupied, whoever they were occupying, they saw them as lower citizens. And the reason why is because they weren't citizens, Right? Roman citizens literally got the opportunity to treat the lower then like trash. A Roman soldier, when Jesus talks about the idea of when they slap you, turn the other cheek, if they want you to walk a mile with their pack, carry it two miles. It wasn't, so, for us, that's a random reference. No one in my life has ever asked me to walk a mile with their pack. Anyone? I've never been asked to walk a mile with their pack. So why would Jesus say that? Because in those times, a Roman officer could just look and say, hey, do me a favor. Here's my stuff. I'm tired of carrying it. You carry it. Because my horse is tired. That's how they saw people, right? If you're not Roman, you're a nobody. We conquered you. You are literally under my feet. So this Roman, Romans would have that perspective. I want us to take a look at a Roman's encounter with Jesus, right? There's a Roman centurion. In Matthew 8, it says, when Jesus returned to Capernaum, a Roman officer came and they pleaded with him. So a Roman officer, not just a Roman citizen, a Roman officer shows up to Jesus, a rabbi of Jewish descent, lowers himself, and the first word he refers to him, he's pleading with a Jew, and he's pleading, and the first word he says is Lord. He's now lowered his status by pleading, and he's lowered it further by referring to a Jew as a Lord. Okay? He says, Lord, my young servant. So he's doing this for who? A servant. Roman, Jews, servant, okay? Just so you understand their perspective, servants would just come and go. If he's sick, too bad, get a new one, right? That was their perspective. He said, sir, my young servant lies in bed, paralyzed and in terrible pain. And Jesus says, I got you. I'm going to come and heal him. And he says, the officer said, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you show up in my home. Like, hold up, don't show up. You could just say the word where you are, and my servant's going to be healed. I know this because I got authority of my superior officers, and I have authority over my soldiers. So this dude is like high in rank. I only say go, they go. I say get over here, they come over here. I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. And when Jesus heard this, he's amazed. And he turns to those who are following him, who are Jews, and he says, I tell you, I haven't seen faith like this Roman centurion that you hate this Roman officer that you hate, he gets it better than you do. What did he get? Was he doing it for himself? He lowered himself by status drastically. He had every right to demand of Jesus according to law. He could have said, Jesus, come to my house and fix my servant right now. And Jesus, according to law, would have to say, cool, do you want me to carry your pack too? But instead, he knew, and he says, I'm going to lower my status, and I'm going to be willing to lower who I am so that they can find healing. Are we willing to lower our status, the way people see us, who we think we are? Are we willing to lower that because somebody less than needs to find Jesus? 
Or do we come sometimes from a perspective of, well, I'm up here. They're still down there. Once they get about halfway up, I'll make sure and I lend a hand. But I'm not going down there. They're going to have to find them some other way. It's unintentional. We don't have that perspective, but the way it looks sometimes is we say, I'm going to prioritize those who are following, and I'm not going to prioritize those that are not. Well, if no one's prioritizing those that are not, how are they ever going to get found? Someone's got to. So that should be our perspective, the servants in our life, the ones that are downtrodden, the ones that should be forgotten, the ones that should be cast aside, the ones that should be replaced in our lives. Can we look down and find them and say, Jesus, can you help them? I mean, I don't care how people see me. I don't care what they think of me. I just want you to help them. That's the kind of contagious faith that when an outsider sees it, they go, ooh, hold up. There's something going on there that I want to be a part of. There's something going on there that's drawing me closer, okay? The second thing for us to prioritize, and, uh, and I will preface this one because the tension in the room is about to grow by like 10 times, okay? We need to prioritize generosity over need. Oh, church talking about money. Oh, yeah, you won't even laugh at that joke. That's how, that's how rough we got just now. Here's the truth of the situation. If greed has your heart, God can't. Okay? And the perspective I want to bring to you, because I know you saw the word need. And a lot of times we think that we're doing the right thing when we're just giving out of our excess. And this is not me. I hope you understand because this is, again, a trap that I fall into all the time. Okay? This is not, I can't come up here and preach the gospel to Sean and just tell you everything that Sean wants you to hear. Okay? What I'm talking about is just a direct reflection of what the gospel teaches us of what it means to follow in this faith. And what we're looking at here is Luke 21, 1 through 4. And it says, while Jesus was in the temple, he watched the rich people dropping their gifts in the collection box. And here's the thing, majority of us, probably 99% of us don't identify as rich. But I want you to understand it's all in perspective. Okay? If I, I, I had an opportunity to go to the country of Uganda And uh, again, if you're joining us from Uganda, you are a beautiful and amazing people. And I know that they would agree that the status of life is different. The things that they would say they prioritize as a need, we would consider just an expectation. It's just there. Food is just there. Food is the expectation. It's not a want or a need. It just happens. The want or the need is a lot of time the luxuries of life that in Uganda they don't prioritize. So when I'm in Uganda, I'm just sitting there in my head in all honesty just going over again and again in my head like, like what did I do to deserve to be born into the situation I'm in? I could have just as easily been born in Uganda and facing the struggles of life and I'm realizing in this moment like it is just all grace. I'm not, I didn't earn the right, I didn't earn the right to have a smart mind that can process and think so I can have a high quality job. I didn't earn the right to have my legs mobile so that I can work in a certain type of job that other people, I did nothing to earn the abilities, the craft, the idea that I have in my mind to do anything to earn the income I have. What does that mean? It means it's all his. It's all his is the status quo. So then a poor widow came by and she dropped in two small coins and Jesus tells his disciples here, he basically stops and he says, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the rest of them. For they've given a tiny part of their surplus, but she, as poor as she is, has given everything she has. And we, (laughs) I'm including me, please understand that. We find it easy to trim off the top of our excess. Now that everything needed is covered, I'm going to trim off the top and I'm going to give that and I'm going to feel good about it. Right? Because that's, but if I'm being honest, I'm not just genuinely looking for need and opportunities to be generous. I'm setting the amount and then I'm saying, what can I do with it now? Because I've set apart what is mine. Now you can have what is yours. It's all his which means when i get the opportunity to have i don't accept it like this i need to accept it like this as i think i've earned a raise i can think i earned a raise and grab it and say awesome now i can get this or i can look and say i i am just me 
God, I have this now. I give it over to you. It's all yours. It's this perspective of that nothing is mine. A.W. Tozer refers to it as the blessedness of possessing nothing. How blessed we are when we realize that nothing I have is mine. It's all his, and I give accordingly. Okay? Y'all love that one. Third and final point I want to touch on. It's this concept of prioritizing faith over our circumstance. Because our life right now can maybe tell us a certain something that isn't lining up with what our lifestyle wishes it was. And so what we have to do is we have to choose faith in a God over the circumstance we're walking in. And believe that no matter what the circumstance I'm walking in, that at the end of it, God be glorified. No matter the outcome, God be glorified. That's our walk and that's our faith and that's what we believe. And we see it so wonderfully in this example in Mark 5, 25 through 34, as we're looking at the woman with bleeding, the issue of blood. Okay, she's suffered for this for like 12 years, right? And so she's coming to Jesus, and she's hit a point, she's broke. She's given all she can to find healing in all these different ways, to find completeness in all these different ways, and all of them have fallen short. And so she's hit this point of desperation to say, God, it can only be through you. I'm going to do everything I can just to get a touch of Jesus in this moment. It says, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. Because she thought to herself, if I could just touch this robe, I'm going to be healed. And Jesus, once she touched him, he realized at once that healing power has gone out of him. So he turned around in the crowd and said, who touched me? Who touched my robe? The disciples logically look around and they say, dude, look at the crowd pressing around you. How are you going to ask who touched me? Everyone is. And Jesus says, who touched me? He kept on looking around to see who had done it. And then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had just happened to her. What had just happened to her is she was just miraculously healed of a condition that she's been suffering through, through for most of her life. And she's just found a miraculous healing to it. And in her mind, she was just going to touch and run. I'm just going to get healed and I'm going to escape. But Jesus drew attention to it for some reason. So he says, who did it? She, she comes and she falls to her knees in front of him. And she tells him what she had done. And this is what Jesus says. He says, daughter, it's your faith that has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. A moment that she thought she's just going to touch and run. I'm going to get my healing and go. See, she didn't realize the magnitude of what Jesus would make this moment become. Because what happens is her prioritizing faith in Jesus over the circumstance of her life where she could have just accepted her fate, been downtrodden, been miserable her whole life, believing this is all God has for her. Instead, she prioritized the faith that Jesus has got something different for me. So she goes out and she grabs it. And she could have gone back and just had this internal healing and nobody knew. But Jesus stops her. And he says, no, no, no. This is going to be celebrated because you prioritized your faith over your circumstance. And he makes sure everybody there is aware of it. And he shows them all and he says, it's your faith. You are well and you will suffer no more. So now not only has she impacted because of her prioritizing faith over circumstance, she has now influenced all those who are there, the crowd surrounding Jesus. And we also know that probably back home there are many individuals very aware of her situation that are now going to hear the story of her prioritizing faith over her circumstance. And now 2,000 years later, the gospel writers are included because they say this woman prioritized her faith over her circumstance. So 2,000 years later, we get to be encouraged by the story of her overcoming. What does that mean for you? That means in your life, when you prioritize your faith over your circumstance, you have no idea the kind of influence that it can create for years to come. You have no idea who's watching your circumstance right now and saying there is no way that they should be surviving this, but somehow or some way they've grabbed hold of something and it's changing their life. You don't know the impact that you can have being felt in your family, in your neighbors, in your friends, and in your community because of your willingness to prioritize faith over circumstance. And that is the major way that you draw people to the faith because then what you say is, yes, that should have crushed me, but because of him, Because of him, I can make it through what's impossible.
Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.